for a little while this morning is the birth, the birth of the church. Amen? Um, now, we know there is a church, you might say church universal, that the Bible speaks about, but also we know there are local churches. Uh, Lomer, Full Gospel Church, is a local church, right? Uh, but we are a part of the church, amen, the church of God. And uh, I was talking to Sister Brenda this morning about uh, exactly when Lomer Church got started. And uh, she was so small and so little, <laughs> she couldn't remember. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to say this. Uh, some of you, do you know more Bob, Larnie, Lonnie and Barbara exactly? I mean, Yeah, okay. And uh, now, it, it was over around where Brother Bill and Susan lives, Mountain View, right? In that, that area for a while. And then it moved to that location of that picture there. And then we're over there now in that picture. So uh, we've, we've moved around a little bit. But still, Lomer Church, we'll call it, local church that was uh, started by Laverne and Louise, I'm going to say Sharon and Brenda, uh, a family that had a burden for young people. And, you know, I can look over the congregation and I can see some of those burdens here this morning. Isn't that something that, that brother and sister... Uh, Wilson had for young people in this community. Um, every church, every church has a beginning. And uh, it's important that we understand the vision of a church. And every church ought to have a vision for the lost, ought to have a vision for uh, the work of God to uh, edify the body of Christ, to build one another up, and serve a purpose in a community. Now, I want to say this about the church. The church is not just made up of a family of blood kin, amen. It may get started that way, but it is a family of, uh, of people, of Christians, if you will, that make up a church. And the church is one body, one body. Now, it has members in that body, but it's still one body. And it's one body under one Lord and one faith. And you might liken it to this. It is an organism. Now, some people refer to a church as an organization. Well, you might say, aren't you a non-profit organization? Well, that's uh, what we are legally set up to be, yes. I mean, it's not like we have this church here to make anybody here lots of money or anything. It's not to profit off. It's a non-profit organization. I understand that. But the thing of it is, the church, I believe, can be described as an organism. And what is an organism? It is a, a live being. <laughs> Amen? 
I said, alive something. And we are told that the Bible calls us uh, as lively stones, doesn't it? Not dead stones or not some mechanical thing out here, but we are alive. We are lively beings. And an organism is a fascinating thing because it pertains to living beings. And a living being such as, well, let's use our physical body for an example. Every part of our body has a purpose, right, physically. Paul explained that when he said, you know, we are members in particular in the body of Christ. He explained it this way, that every part, every member has a part to play in the body, the hands, the feet, uh, and everything that we have in our physical bodies plays a part. Now, when a body functions properly is when every joint supplies, right? If you've got a, a, a joint that's not working just right, it affects the rest of the body, right? Physically, we know how that works. And it's the same way spiritually because uh, everything in our spiritual body uh, should work and, and supply, and it feeds off of itself. Life sows life, right? Life develops life. So that's what I like to think of when I think of a, uh, a local church or any church is that life develops within the body, okay? Life should be developing in the body of believers here at Lomer Church, right? With every part supplying. Now, in the church... Did you know we're called different things? You may have been called some things that weren't very pleasant, but, you know, we're all called things in the body of Christ. We call one another brother and sisters, don't we? So we are called the brethren. We are called... Believers. Why are we called believers? Because we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We're called saints. Now, uh, a saintly person is somebody who you would probably project as being uh, sanctified and, and living a good life. So, hey, um, I, I don't hear the word saints a whole lot anymore, but it still uh, pertains, I believe, to the uh, church, don't you? We're called the elect. Why? Because God has chosen us out of the world to be a part of His church. We're also called disciples. Now, that's one that we really, I think, need to emphasize because Jesus called those that followed Him disciples, right? A disciple is a follower, a disciple is somebody who is willing to learn, okay? So we need to be good disciples, right? And, of course, we know uh, we're called Christians. Uh, the book of Acts tells about it. The Antioch church is where they first started calling them Christians because they realized these believers were trying to act like and do what Jesus did. So they said, well, you're Christians and and, and then in another place in the book of Acts, it, it talks about them being of the people that are in the, the way, W-A-Y. They're, uh, they're the way of, of, of what Christ walked. So there's different names that we are called. Now, I want us to look for a while now actually at three different dispensations. Now, a dispensation is, in, in what I'm talking about here out of the Bible, is 
an order of events um, under divine authority. Um, events that happen. Now, God is big on events. Huh? God has planned events. He has planned them throughout the, uh, the things that we find recorded in the Bible. There are planned events that's going to happen uh, in the future and in the ages to come. God has planned events. Now, the church is nothing new, really. The church is something that, that God has planned for in the beginning. Truly, He has. So, what is the church? The church is God's eternal plan for His people. Hmm? It's nothing to be just taken casually. This is something God has planned for, and it has a, a lot to do about His people. Now, uh, if you want to go with me to the book of Acts chapter 7, um, and let's, let's start here in uh, the account that was given about Abraham and, and the children of Israel. Uh, let, let's begin in Acts 7 and 32, where it says, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said, the, that's when God appeared to Moses. Then said the Lord unto him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the ground where thou standest is holy ground. Well, I tell you what, I mean, I believe the church needs to be holy ground. <laughs> Amen. But I also see something else here. If I walk outside uh, and stand somewhere else, I can still be standing on holy ground. You believe that? Amen. So we are the church moving about. We're mobile, okay? Now, verse 34 says, I have seen, I've seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I am come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send thee into Egypt. Then This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who? That's what the Israelites said to Moses. Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. Verse 36. He brought them out after that he had shewed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. Verse 37. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. Now, what that is saying, that's none other than Jesus coming. He is a prophet like unto Moses that God has raised up. Verse 38 says this, This is he, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Now, we do see here that uh, even when in the Old Testament where the children of Israel was wandering about in the wilderness, God referred to them as the church, or you could say the assembly. They were an assembly of people, uh, a couple of hundred or a couple of million or so. And uh, that was the church in the wilderness, which with the angel which spake unto him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers 
who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Now, uh, the church in the wilderness, you can use it of the word ecclesia. Now, that church or ecclesia, uh, you know, if we're actually uh, serving the Lord as a church should, then we are an ecclesiastic type church, right? We spread the gospel. We do the things God wants us to do. But the word ecclesia means called out. Now, the children of Israel, what this is pointing to, God's saying, I've been with you. I'm going to lead you out of Egypt. But you are a called out people. You are called out from the other nations of this world. We are, as believers today, we are called out of the world. The things of the world should not be in us. We ought to be called out people. So, um, and in doing so, back then, God's, what he's saying here in verse 38, the church that was in the wilderness, God gave them the law, right? The Old Testament law. He gave it to them, His church. He gave it to Moses up on top of Mount Sinai, right? God Himself, the Father, if you will, came down and uh, He gave the Old Testament law on Mount Sinai. He gave it to, once again, His chosen people, uh, the seed of Abraham. That's what He said up there, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He gave it to the seed of Abraham. Now, this was the God and a dispensation of the Father, if you will, ministering to His chosen people under the Old Covenant or under, as we say, the Old Testament. Now, we know that the Bible says pertaining to the Godhead, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are what? One, one in purpose, one in unity. So what was the rest of the Godhead doing under this dispensation of the law in the Old Testament? Well, we know that God's Holy Spirit was still around. book of Genesis says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep, amen, of the waters, and the creation in Genesis 1 and 2. But the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, did move upon people, came upon people, the prophets of old, came upon men and moved and allowed them to do mighty and great works, right? So he was around. And you know what? That's one thing that I believe the children of Israel understood quite a bit about is, you know, hey, we've got God's Spirit on our side. Whenever they obeyed Him, God's Spirit was there to help them. I also believe that what we mentioned, the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word was made flesh, and we know the Word, uh, as, as we understand, was Jesus, right? The Word was made flesh. Jesus came. Now, I, I do believe that there are instances in the Old Testament of where there was appearances of the Word, or we might even say a pre-incarnate Jesus before Bethlehem. Uh, I, I've wondered there, when that angel appeared to Abraham, or Abram, and told him there, you know, about uh, what he had made him, the father of many nations. I, I wonder if that might have been uh, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Or I might even make it a little more uh, specific here. Who was the fourth man in the fire? <laughs> One likened to the Son of God. So, you know, uh, let's keep in mind God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. It was around even back then throughout the Old Testament because they were there from the beginning. Amen? Now, so that would be one dispensation, keeping in mind an order of events 
that are under divine authority. All right. God recognized the church. Now, the next dispensation of the Godhead was the coming of God's only begotten Son. Amen? That's another dispensation. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, uh, Christ's earthly ministry, some 30 years, maybe 33 years, something like that, Christ's earthly ministry proved some things. It proved that He has love for mankind. Now, Jesus healed the sick. He did miracles to meet people's needs because He loved humanity. Right? Right? He was God, still is God, always will be God, but He took upon Himself flesh. We call that the incarnation, God becoming man. So this dispensation was very much needed. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, And I want us to look in verse 25. It says here, For husbands to love your wives, even as Christ, listen to this, even as Christ also loved, what? The church. Christ loved the church. That makes you feel better, doesn't it? And what did he do because of that? That he gave himself for it. So we need to consider that. How much did he love it? He gave his life for it. That's how much he loved it. He says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church. Amen. You still believe... The church ought to be a glorious church. I do. Not having a spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. Now, God endorsed, if you will, Jesus of Nazareth. In Matthew chapter uh, 3, verse 17, He said, This is... My beloved Son, hear ye Him. Amen? So, at the appointed time, another this dispensation, the appointed time of God, God became man. And here's what Jesus did. He fulfilled the work and the will of God. The Father. Now, somebody said, How do you get to know the Father? Go to your Bible because Jesus came to reveal the Father. Amen. He kept revealing Him, kept the Father in heaven, knows you have need of these things. My Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus came to reveal the Father. Jesus came to do the work and the will of His heavenly Father. Wow. That was a much-needed dispensation, wasn't it? Well, if if it wasn't for the birth, the death, and the burial of Jesus Christ, we'd all be lost, right? Okay. Now, the remaining time here, I want to talk about the time between Jesus' ascension, tells about it there in Acts chapter 1, His ascension on, from the Mount of Olivet 
and His second coming. That's the time or the dispensation that we are living in right now. Amen? This is the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. Right? We're living in it. Jesus said, I must needs go away. Because if I go not away, the Comforter cannot come. He went away. The Comforter has come. And I want us to understand, we, uh, under, the Holy Ghost is something that we need to believe in. Brother Jim taught on it this morning. We need to be filled with Him. We need Him maybe more than we realize we need Him. To the church, to the church is what God gave the Holy Spirit for. He gave it to us. He gave it because the Holy Spirit's work is to fulfill something in our hearts and in the lives of believers. And what He is working and doing right now is to fulfill what Jesus came and did and gave to the church. What did Jesus do for the church? He gave to the church <laughs> everything we need. He gave to the church gifts. Hmm? Five-fold ministry, right? He gave to the church a rock to stand on. Amen? And Jesus told His disciples there in, in Matthew chapter 18, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen? So, we being believers know that God's emphasis upon the church that started back in the Old Testament come through sending His Son to be the head of the church. He's still working in the church. Amen? Now, I, I want us to go to the Gospel of St. John chapter 14, and let's look at verses 10 through 12. Jesus says this, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? All right. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but it is the Father that dwelleth in me. He does the works. Now, let me tell you how that works. It works through the Spirit of God. Amen? That's what it does. God sent His Spirit. He sent His Son. Jesus said, I will pray the Father and He will send you another Comforter. But Jesus is emphasizing here the need of the Spirit of God. He said, He does the works. Verse 11, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father's in me, or else believe me, for the very work's sake. <laughs> you know, isn't it kindly sad in a way that people won't just believe Jesus for what He says? Jesus has to say, well, if you don't want to believe what I'm telling you, just look at my works. And you know, there's people in the world today that's like that. You know, oh, you say you're a Christian, but, you know, that's just a name tag that you probably hung on yourself or something like that. You know, I believe it's time. We all from Missouri, I guess. We're a show-me state, right? 
Amen. We need to go out and show people. If you ain't going to believe me for what I say I am and who I believe in, amen, just take note of what I do. Be a doer of the word, of the works. Amen. All right. Now, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Praise God. And greater works than these shall he do because, we're ready for a new dispensation here, because I go unto my Father. Now let's not get the big head and say I can do greater works than Jesus. No, he, he could do anything he wanted to do, led by the Spirit of God, yes. But keep in mind, we can do greater works more in quantity than in quality. You still with me? Because if we have the Holy Spirit working in us, in the church, the way He wants to work, guess what? The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times present. Jesus was only in one place at one time, right? He's everywhere. Keep that in mind. And that's how we do greater works. And another thing that the Holy Spirit does, He testifies of Jesus. Now, Jesus right now, somebody said, where did Jesus go? Well, He went back to heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Is seated, present tense. He is seated at the right hand of the Father where He ever liveth to make intercession for you and me. In other words, people that's in the church, right? He's there for us, seated at the right hand of the Father. All right. Now, uh, let's, let's look here if you're in St. John. Let's look in Luke chapter 2. 24, how, how this actually took place, amen. You like history of things, history of the church, history of how things happened, amen. I, I do, amen. In Luke 24 and verse 49, here's what Jesus told His disciples uh, right before He ascended, right? Carried up into heaven in verse 51. It says, And behold, Luke 24, 59, And behold, I send the promise of my Father. Who said? Jesus said, I send it. Upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Praise God. Now, that was actually a command, but Jesus knew they needed it. Somebody said, well, why did He have to specify the city of Jerusalem? Well, that's where the Holy Spirit was going to initially come. Somebody says, well, do I have to go to Jerusalem to get the Holy Spirit? No, He's everywhere. Amen. You can get it wherever you are. You can receive Him. Amen. That's good news. So this was what Jesus told them to do. Now in the book of Acts chapter 2, we find that, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And the Bible says in verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, uh, keep in mind, Pentecost is a Jewish holiday, Right? It took place 50 days after uh, 
the uh, Passover, correct? And that's when Jesus told them to assemble. Now, there's some, there's some wonderful connections. We won't go into them this morning, but wonderful connections between these Jewish holidays that I think God used in bringing this to pass at this appointed time. You know, scriptures just tie together and harmonize so well when you rightly divide them. They sure do. Amen. But here's my point. Talking about the church. The 120, the Bible says about 120, but we'll say 120. The 120 that, uh, disciples that was in the upper room witnessed something. Oh my, it was supernatural, wasn't it? It was something like you just don't see in the natural. They witnessed something great supernatural power. But I also believe that they witnessed the birth of the New Testament church. Amen? Everything has a beginning. The New Testament church wasn't in effect in the Old Testament, right? God's plan was. I believe right there on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, we find the birthing of the New Testament church. You know what the New Testament church is? It is the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is the head. That's what gets the church into trouble sometimes. Man starts to think he's the head. Amen? <laughs> he's the head of the church. Amen? And let me tell you something else. It's his church. I said it's his church. Amen? Somebody said, well, how, how do you make it as a pastor with all the problems and things that comes against the church, the local church, and everything like that. I mean, well, if you just tried to handle everything yourself, you'd probably be in a lot of trouble. But you know what? You go to God and you remind Him, Lord, it's your church. <laughs> Is that a good way to pass the responsibility? <laughs> you know, we all like passing the buck. So I just remind it's your church, Lord. Oh, yeah, there's unpleasant things that happens in a church. Sad to say. Not everybody are sanctified, Holy Ghost-filled Christians. <laughs> but it's a pleasure to minister to people that are obeying God, right? That are saints of God and, and believers in Jesus Christ. It's a pleasure. And, uh, but keep in mind, it's His church. It's His church. It's His church, and He loves us so much that He gave us His Holy Spirit. All right. In conclusion here, I want to say, the Holy Spirit of God, if you want to put it in about the smallest nutshell you can put it in, it would be this. He is here to build us up. Oh, he plays a part. I mean, you cannot get born into this church without his involvement, okay? The Spirit is there when you are born again. That's for a fact. But he is there after we are saved to build us up. I, I love the word edify. Do you like the word edify? We all need edification. We all need comfort, right? He's there to edify us he's there to charge us up amen now think about this consider yourself like a battery a battery gets run down <laughs> you know and it doesn't seem to have a lot of life to it anymore it'll just click instead of start your car for example you know what that battery needs Needs a good charging. Amen? If it's got good cells in it, it'll charge right back up. 
You know, I, I find out the Holy Ghost is a good battery charger <laughs> in my spirit, man. Amen? Hallelujah. And here's another thing, too. Let's not limit what the Holy Spirit can do in our lives as a part of a local church. I'm going to set the goal real high this morning. Is that okay? He also wants to perfect us. Amen? Perfect us. Hmm. That's what the fivefold ministry is for, the perfecting of the body of Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. So don't limit the one that Jesus sent to us. I, I, I could point out different scriptures in the New Testament, the writings of the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul did this time and time again. He recognized his whole ministry was inspired by the Spirit of God. Amen? We need to do the same, church. Everything that we have as far as a minister in the church has to be inspired by the Spirit of God. Amen? You know, when the flesh gets inspired, I don't get inspired. I, I don't get edified. <laughs> Amen? But when the Spirit inspires something, then it overflows and other people get inspired. Amen? You know, we read there, the, the book of Acts that we were in, you know, and uh, it, my Bible here, it just says, well, it does say that. It says right here up at the top, the Acts of the Apostles. Now, I, don't, I understand what it means, don't have a problem with that, but I've heard it said, maybe it would be better said that that are the Acts of the Holy Ghost. Amen? The Acts of the Holy Ghost, because He has His part to play. Okay. Uh, one more scripture. Go with me to 1 John. 1 John. And we'll sum this up, okay? 1 John chapter 4. And I want us to begin in verse 13. The beloved Apostle John had some great revelation, didn't he? Listen to this. He says, hereby, he's talking about the life of love. Amen? He says, hereby know we that we dwell in him. Know it. And he in us. Wow. What a... Mm. What a revelation. Because He hath given us of His, what? Spirit. How do I know? What witness do I have in me that I am a child of God? His Spirit bearing witness with my spirit that I am a son of God. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Man. All right. Verse 14, and we have seen and we do testify that the Father, that's what we've been talking about, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Mm. Ain't nothing else that can offer that, I'm here to tell you. Verse 15 says, whosoever... I'm a whosoever. How about you? Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. Hmm. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us because God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Okay, what's the Holy Ghost wanting to do in each one of our lives? He's wanting to take that love of God 
that we have, that God has for us, and then He's wanting to do verse 17. Let's read it. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Listen to this. Because as He is, who's the He? Jesus. As He is, so are we in this world. Praise, give the Lord a hand clap for that. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Wouldn't it be good to see a whole bunch of Jesuses going around? <laughs> Casting out devils and healing the sick. Amen. As He is. As Jesus is right now. Jesus is doing quite well. He's alive and well. As He is, so are we in the world. You believe that? Hallelujah. So let's let what the Holy Ghost is trying to do in each one of our lives, let it shine. Amen. And I'm saying to you this morning, oh, what a Savior. <laughs> oh, what a church that we are a part of. Would you stand?